Welcome to The Staff Room, a podcast which takes a look into the world of education. In this series, we chat to inspirational educators far and wide about pedagogy, shed light on great practice and discuss new and exciting ideas. My name is Michael Royale and I'm sitting here with Tessa Johnson and we're coming to you from Corpus Christi College in Perth, Australia. In this episode, we'll be talking about the power of learning visuals and its basis in cognitive psychology. We'll be chatting to former specialist school head teacher Oliver Caviglioli about the use of visuals such as sketch noting to conceptualise, categorise and organise information to enhance learning. What makes sketch noting effective for learning when you not so much I'm going to look at not when you create it, but when you go back and use it. So it's effectiveness when you go back and reread your notes. Is and it's a tip I use constantly when people ask me for advice about their sketch notes. Is and the one word I say is restraint. So restrain yourself from using too many words. Restrain yourself from making decorative, over elaborate drawings. Restrain yourself from using too great a colour palette and restrain yourself from trying to fill every piece of paper. I'm Michael Royale. And I'm Tessa Johnson. And this is The Staff Room. So we are back for season two and uh, some great guests already lined up. And starting off on a real high, Oliver Caviglioli, a very, I guess, well-respected, well-respected educator and um, theorist within the education realm. And he's going to talk to us about visual learning yeah um, I mean it's something I'm pretty excited to actually learn more about because I know that we have touched on it before with when we spoke to Dr. Jana Weinstein in episode seven but I mean since then I've sort of looked at ways to consciously integrate it into my lessons and also my notes for myself and it's worked to an extent except it'll be nice to actually look at the science behind it and understand why it works and why it should work and help my students learn better I think as well, there's there's an element of it that does work, but then I think some students maybe it, it isn't as practical as it can be. I know I look at a lot of my senior students and their my map, map, their my maps, and they look fantastic, but I wonder if sometimes they're a little bit too congested, or you know, if they need to necessarily put as much detail as they do into some <laughs> of the illustrations, or if that's just maybe a bit of procrastination. <laughs> so yeah, I think I'm hoping we're going to hear some uh, really useful, applicable tips as to how best to sort of um, use visuals. Yeah, I mean, taking. there's any way that I can possibly take better notes and I'm happy to hear it. That's right. And we've actually got a couple of colleagues here as well at our school that have published a book um, on sketch noting, a sort of a practice that we're hopefully going to talk quite a bit with Oliver about. Uh, and it's called The Science of Sketch Noting. And it's uh, on iBooks. And it's free and it is, yeah, it's very, very interesting, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, it goes into this whole idea of actually learning through a combination of visual and verbal information, which is exactly what I'm hoping um, Oliver's going to be able to talk to us today about as well and shed some more light on this. Excellent. So shall we begin? Yeah, we shall. Let's do it. Let's do it. Oliver Caviglioli is an information designer who is widely known as an expert in visualising educational concepts. In recent years, he has worked with lots of different teacher authors in illustrating their books. Oliver's work is acclaimed for promoting visual concepts based in cognitive research. Oliver joins us via Skype today to chat about the importance of visuals in learning. So Oliver, thanks for joining us. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, I started teaching in 1976, that's a while ago, um, and pretty soon I ended up in a special school um, where eventually I became a head teacher. And during those decades in the special school, looking back, I realised how important it was that I was educated by educational psychologists into the rigours of behaviourism. And as we know nowadays, no one ever utters the word behaviourism because it's been thrown out, but it, there are some really useful aspects to it. Um, and much, well, some of the cognitive science that's been rediscovered, I originally knew as behaviorist um, approaches, but I won't go into that in too much detail. But behaviorism has helped me enormously in my visualizations because I see drawing as essentially a way of sneaking in behaviorist approaches, because if you can't see it, you can't draw it. 
And that seemed to be pretty much the criterion for behaviorism. Um, my father was an architect. I chose a young person not to follow him, but I realized his legacy followed me. And so I eventually joined up my education and behaviorism and my architectural visual legacy and put them together. And that's what I'm, I'm doing now. I have written a, a number of books on visual strategies and I invented something called the how-tos, which are visual step-by-step -step guides to teaching techniques. Oh yeah, and that's actually what we're obviously here to talk to you about today. So we're really, really big fans of your work. Your illustrations are fantastic. We've had quite a lot of fun going through some of your sketch notes and some of the little portraits you've done of people that we've actually interviewed. Uh, and in particular, we're big fans of what you've done with Dr. Weinstein and Dr. Sumeraki. Um, we spoke to Dr. Weinstein earlier in the year as well. Um, can you tell us why you think your visuals are becoming so popular with educators around the world? Well, firstly, they're free. <laughs> so that helps. The other thing that um, I think listeners might find quite strange is that I'm really clear that the visual skills that I have are used in service of something. And what they're in service of is words. So when you look at my visuals, although I, you know, I'll do portraits and things, um, those that summarize educational ideas or processes are overwhelmingly full of words. And I feel that there needs to be a bit of a rebalance when we look at visuals and, and to acknowledge that many visuals may not have any, even any sketches or drawings, they are simply words. So what, what I find most useful is the distinction between text, which is completely linear, and other forms that include words, but are not so linear. So if you look at graphic organizers, then they, they, they just consist of words, but they use them in non-linear formats. The other thing that I think um, has helped is that, um, as I said, because of my, my father's architectural background and graphic background, I'm really clear of some graphic principles that I employ, um, which, I should, which are to do with organization. So I'm really clear that everything should be organized and everything should be aligned and so really basic graphic rules, and there's enough white space. And then I employ those in a variety of formats. So if you look at my website, you know, there's icons, there's portraits, there's sketch notes, there's infographics, uh, different posters. So it happens in a variety of different formats, but those principles um, are still the same. What they're not, although I have lived through the hippie era in the 60s and 70s, what I see is a lot of current sketch notes, to me, are echoes of the hippie aesthetic. So an over attempt to, to feel artistic and flourishes and to fill every bit of space, white space up. I think they're less effective. And I think, I think my style is I use less rather than more. So do you think perhaps that sketch note needs to be more authentic to the individual rather than, yeah, aesthetically pleasing? No, I don't. I think the opposite. I think they should be less individualistic in the sense that the word individualistic sometimes prompts people to think they ought to be artistic. Um, so a great distinction I learned early on, even though I can draw uh, pretty well, is Don Moyer, who does, um, he introduced the notion of sketching as communication, not sketching as art. So the simpler the sketch, the clearer the line, no, no um, feathery lines, shading, all those elaborations. You just need to get the, con the conceptual grasp of what it is that you're drawing. And if you look at the works of Dave Gray on YouTube, he has some instructional videos. He's a fabulous artist. He was a professor of art at university, but he'll teach you how to draw using essentially squares, triangles, and circles. Yeah. Um, and in essence, doing that sketch-wise is the equivalent of how we summarise with words. So it's knowing what to leave out and getting down to the, the essentials to communicate an idea. So it's almost it's almost an art form in itself to be to be trained to do this effectively. I mean, if you look at your sketch notes, they are all your as you said, they are very linear. There's plenty of spaces. Um, there isn't a sort of a um, too many 
too many visuals, in fact. Um, and, yeah, I guess it's, it's sort of an art form in itself, getting mm-hmm. it right. Yeah, it's not too busy, which is good. Moving on to the next question, Oliver, it is a bit of a digression from the previous one. But do you think that all teachers should know about cognitive psychology? Yes, I do. And I've been trying to think of why it is. Um, particularly when I look at the issue of cognitive load, my view is that, um, and some teachers, particularly my generation, who've been brought up in the progressive mould, um, and which, which is very aspirational, and, I mean, those who condemn it say it's just romantic, it's very aspirational about the possibilities of what human brains can do. What I think teachers brought up in that kind of background find difficult to accept is the fact that we're just a lump of biology. And as a lump of biology, we have restrictions. So no one can run 100 metres in five seconds. And similarly, um, human beings are limited by um, the amount of information they can use and process at any one time. And so the idea of cognitive load, why it doesn't give you specific, simple answers about how much information you can, you can give in which subject to which pupils. As a general reminder, um, that we're working within our biological limits, I think it's enormously useful. It stops us getting too carried away with our romantic aspirations of what's possible. So you recommend more of a stripped back approach, basically? Is that what you're saying? Yes, I am, yes. And the other, of course, the criticism of cognitive science has always been that it, the its strengths are viewed as being its weaknesses. So its strengths to me are that they, some of these experiments with memory are over a century, you know, over hundred years old and they are, and they are replicated and they're replicated because, and this is some see as being its weakness. It takes place in laboratories and often, as you know, with university students. Um, and so they think it's less um, applicable, but the danger of, Educational research is that I shockingly read a number of years ago, less than 1% is ever attempted to be replicated. Um, And so I think that a diet for teachers is to use both educational research and also cognitive research that happens in laboratories because because it's been around so long and because it doesn't fail to be replicated. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, So two of our colleagues have actually recently published a book on sketchnoting and we're wondering if you can possibly explain why you think sketchnoting is such an effective method of learning. Well, the biggest um, factor, I think, is something that, that it's the second half of the word rather than the first half. Rather than concentrating on the sketch, which I will do, I'm going to look at the, the note faction. Um, summarising has a consistently high effect size. And, you know, we, we've, we've been misled in the past by looking at inaccurate interpretations of what we mean by active and passive learning. So you can be passive physically in a chair and you can listen to someone talk or you can read, but what's really active is inside between your ears. And summarising is one of the most powerful activities that can happen. I went to an old-fashioned English grammar school and every day we had to do pracy. And looking back, I, I consider pracy to be almost uh, the steroids of learning. Um, There's no way you can understand something if you can't communicate it in your own words in shortened form. So that entails, for me, doing a couple of things. One is knowing what to discard. So you're culling, and culling is a really important part because you're making a distinction between um, core idea, peripheral idea. And then with the core ideas, you then have to find your own words to express it. Um, so that, to me, is the most important part of sketch noting. And then um, that same process happens in a slightly different way when you're deciding what visual would, would happen. You're, well, when you do um, visuals in sketch noting, I'm aware of the work of Ruth Colvin Clark, uh, who's written several books on visual and graphic learning and evidence-based training, that we should make distinctions between decorative visuals and explanatory visuals. So I'm going to talk about explanatory visuals rather than decorative visuals that I think don't help. In fact, they can add to cognitive load. In explanatory visuals, you're essentially intellectually doing the same things when you're summarising with notes. You're focusing on the key essential parts, and then you're looking to see whether there are any type of connections. Um, 
one of the ways I think people can improve their sketch noting is when they make connections, they need to, as best they can, to try and identify what the nature of these connections are. So let me explain. Um, if we have two elements, um, two small chunks of notes, we, they, they may be connected. We need to try and work out what that connection is. So it could be that one is, one is a part of the other, or it could be that the two are equal, but they're contrasted. Or it may be that one is um, temporally or sequentially comes afterwards. So there's a temporal link. Or it may even be that one of them is the cause and one's the effect. So asking yourself these questions um, increases the intensity with which you're processing the information. And then other than that, I think what makes sketch noting effective for learning when you not so much I'm looking to look at not when you create it, but when you go back and use it. So it's effectiveness when you go back and reread your notes is, and it's a tip I use constantly when people ask me for advice about their sketch notes, is and the one word I'd say is restraint. So restrain yourself from using too many words, restrain yourself from making decorative over elaborate drawings, restrain yourself from using too great a color palette, and restrain yourself from trying to fill every piece of paper. That's good, because I was actually going to ask about that, because you said culling is important, whereas I feel like I'd almost be what would be considered a hoarder, I suppose, um, the exact opposite. So those are really good tips on how to strip back and make sure that it actually does assist you with, you know, actually learning and retaining the information. Yeah, and you mentioned the effect size as well of, of summarising and using sketch noting to summarise. Uh, do you think that this is something that should be, you know, practice more regularly in the classroom with kids I know we obviously teach them to we do teach them to you know mind map and um, to collate their notes but I think sketch noting is yeah a little bit more of a refined technique that is going to be quite new yes well I you know I've, I've been teaching graphic organizer for a couple of decades now and on reflection I think the best way to do it is a teachers to model it so they can be modeling both the finished product or if they do model as they create it, they need to be really effective and confident they're going to be doing it. Otherwise, they need to prepare it sneakily beforehand. Um, and what's, what I think is really important is when you're doing it, be aware that while you're, while you're modeling, say, sketch note, the creation of a sketch note, what you're really modeling is your thinking processes. Um, and so to align and coordinate you're speaking with what you're doing on a board and a visualizer would be the best way of doing it because you can face your class and they can see um, behind you what you're drawing and, and writing. And when you're doing that, go through all your thinking processes. So I was thinking about doing this, but then I've realized when I look at that information and then perhaps they might have the original text, I'm thinking that's kind of peripheral. That's not important. So this is the most important bit that I'm asking myself, which of these words are most important? So if I have any order, which one comes first? So thinking in that in that type of way and doing the same thing with the drawings. That's really interesting. We've we've um, spoken a little bit about live modeling, but that's it's interesting you say it yeah, is to actually verbalize your thought processes as well. I can I can see how that would work really well with the kids. One of the things that struck me over um, a long time is you know classrooms are full of um, thirty novices and one expert, and um, and one of the dangers is that teachers can do great teaching. And the result, this has happened to me when I was at school. So I used to sit back and I used to really admire my teachers, their enthusiasm, their passion, um, the way they spoke about their subjects. And the major thing I learned from that was they were very, very clever. And what they gave me was the, was the product of their cleverness, the product of their expertise, but they didn't necessarily share how that cleverness and expertise worked. And that's where I think the power of modeling, particularly when you're modeling and you're using something visual, whether in sketch notes, you're able to embody what you're thinking, then you're able to show and demonstrate the process by which you end up with this product. Everyone admires, but they don't know how you got there. So you're able to demonstrate the process as well as the product. Um, so... Moving on now, are you actually an advocate of technology in the classroom and do you think it can help with creating powerful learning visuals? I have 
to say I'm quite neutral. I'm, I'm, I've been serially disappointed by technology, but I'm talking way back in the mid 80s, you know, and I, um, the first time I didn't get disappointed was when I bought a Mac in, an Apple back in 1989. Um, that would have been I like that would have been a very big apple back in nineteen eighty nine. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I've been disappointed. I've been really aware of Bill Gates' notion. He says that um, in the short term, um, technology will always disappoint and it will have little effect. In the long term, it, it's invariably going to have a greater, greater effect. And I think that's what I've seen. Each little um, breakthrough, as promised, has always tended to disappoint. But when you look back over decades, you see what an impact it has had. But as I'm not in a classroom, I'm really not in a position to be able to give any um, valid conclusion on that. I'm really not an expert at all. But I can talk about um, technology helping me create powerful learning visuals. So I'm, a, I'm an Adobe um, fan, so I use Photoshop, on, but mainly I use Illustrator. So Illustrator allows me to do pretty much all of my graphics. It's so powerful. And, but there are other cheaper, simpler sketch um, or similar apps that, that teachers could use. But always I'm aware, perhaps one of the most powerful um, things that I've learned recently in education is the opportunity cost. So for me, I, I learned it anyway. For a teacher starting off, I would say the opportunity cost of using some of these more advanced apps is too great. They could be doing other things. However, there are a whole host of other apps that allow you almost instant, instant success. So, I mean, I don't use them because I create my own personalized infographics. There are many apps in which you can um, create infographics either with data or, or any other banner type infographics with images and icons that you, you just put on board. So I think that's available and there's no hardly any opportunity cost for teachers. Yeah. I think as well in terms of a, of a modeling, um, in a modeling sense, being able to you know project your your infographic, sorry, your sketch notes and things up onto the board, and maybe making those available in classrooms, that would obviously be be a big plus as well. Possibly the visualizer, one of the most powerful bits of um, technology that teachers could use. Yes, yeah. Um, our last question for today: If you could recommend one professional reading book to a new teacher, what would it be and why? Uh, that's really, really difficult. So I was looking at the idea of a new teacher, but I, given that teacher's energy, enthusiasm and time is so limited, and here in England we have a real problem with um, retention, so many teachers leave, I think one of the most powerful distinctions we can offer new teachers is tell them what not to do and what doesn't work. Yeah. And in that sense, I think Daisy Christodoulou's Seven Myths About Education is probably the most the safest bet to give a new teacher so it really identifies all those aspects of education that used to dominate British education and used to be part of the inspectorate framework and has ruined thousands and thousands of teachers because of their ineffective and romantic notions and delusional notions that Daisy's book just sets you really clear Really, so it's not instruction in a sense of do this, do this, do this, but it tells you what not to do, and that's just so powerful. Yeah, no, Michael and myself are both new teachers, and um, yeah, we can definitely relate to a lot of what you just said. Yeah. Just cutting out all the things that you know, all the all the idealism, I guess, of the ideal teacher and and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, Oliver, for our listeners, could you possibly let us know where they can actually find you online? Yes, yeah, sure. If you go to, I've shortened Oliver Caviglioli to Ollie Cav, O L I C A V. If you go to ollicav.com, um, I've just recently um, created this website, and pretty much 90% of it is free and downloadable. So if you go there, you'll see uh, um, about nine categories of visuals from quotes and portraits and icons and sketch notes and posters. Um, you can go there. You can follow me on Twitter, where I have the same name. I'm at Ollie Cav. And if you wanted to email me, I'm oliver at ollicab.com. Excellent. And also uh, your new book with uh, Dr. Yana Weinstein and Dr. Megan Sumeraki. Yes, that's called Understanding How We Learn. That was great fun, a real learning experience for me. Um, just, just in a sense to summarise the whole focus on visuals, it's impossible to illustrate something unless you understand it. 
And so I was able to constantly get personalized seminars from both of them by showing them my visuals and asking which bit did I get right, which bit didn't I understand. And then they corrected me. It's a fabulous way. It, in, it epitomizes the essence of understanding and feedback to the teacher. Because at the same time as it being a test of my understanding, in some ways a test of their explanation. So you get a, first, you know, a, a full, complete and virtuous loop, feedback loop. That's great. And also, where can we actually find that book as well for our listeners? It's on Amazon. All right, amazing. Um, or from the publishers, Routledge. Okay, perfect. Thanks for that. Um, that's great. And also, thanks so much for your time as well, Oliver. It was really, really insightful. And um, Tess and I have gained a lot from what you've had to say. So thank you. Yeah, along with having like lots of fun looking through all your sketch notes, I think we feel quite inspired as well to, to get sketch noting in our classrooms. That's great. And you'll have the word um, restraint all the time now, won't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. Cull and restraint, the two main ones for me anyway. That's all right. I'm okay with those two words. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Th- thank you again, Oliver. Thanks, Ollie. Actually, thank you. It's been an honour. Thank you for asking me. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, Tess. So um, what did you take out of that? Well, I really liked how Oliver gave really practical tips for teachers uh, and how we can actually teach this sketch noting. We've spoken about live modeling before on the show, haven't we? And we've t- we both use live modeling mm. in our classes. And I, I really liked how he said, you know, it, it really does help to model sketch noting to the kids and actually verbalize your thought processes as you're going. And that's something that I, I definitely will be keen to try with, mm. with the students because I know they like it when they model things. Whether or not that's because I'm giving them the answers or not, I'm not sure. Um, but I think actually, yeah, verbalizing that process to them whilst I'm sketchnoting, I think they'll really get a lot out of that. How about you, Michael? Yeah, I mean, with a similar theme there, I think it's just good to model it because a lot of the time students don't really know how to actually take notes. So if we can just sort of show them that almost less is more and it's not really about, as Oliver said, it's not necessarily about an indiv- individualistic approach. Like you should definitely do it in a way that is structured and regimented because that does, as proven by him and so many others, tend to work best. Yeah, I love that saying less is more because if I can be doing less, (laughs) then that's more for me. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening to The Staff Room and thanks to our guest, Oliver Kubiglioli. If you'd like to follow us on Twitter, my handle is at Michael underscore Royale and Tessa's is at Tessa underscore Johnson too. Please make sure you subscribe to our podcast on either iTunes or Stitcher. And feel free to leave a review and give us any feedback on the show. Listen out for our next episode of The Staff Room, which will be available shortly. I'm Michael Royale. And I'm Tessa Johnson. Thanks for listening. 